Come on, church. Come on. All right. There we go. Come on, church. Can we give God another praise? You guys sound so good worshiping your Savior. Come on. He is a good God. Amen. I am so excited to be with you guys tonight. It has been an amazing summer, right? We just got out of Soul Winter Summer. Can we give a shout for 3,000 souls? And we have been ushered into Vision 1728. Come on, come on. We need more, more claps for that. Does anybody need some vision in the house? God has a vision for your life. God has a plan, and his plan is to use you to impact more lives. Go ahead and tell your neighbor while you sit down right now. God's got a plan. God's got a vision. Come on, with your name on it. Come on, God is faithful. I am so, so excited because I am really loud. They should have, am I okay? You don't, your ears are okay? No, okay, stop it. I don't trust that side of the room. I'm going to stay focused right here. Love you guys. Hi, online. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, guys. Love you guys online that are tuning in. I have just been meeting more and more people that are finding about the Wayworld Outreach. They're all over. I met somebody in Yuma, Arizona. I know she is watching online. I, we're meeting people all over Southern California. We're meeting people who don't have cars, don't have transportation, but they have heard about the way. Amen? All right, that's exciting. I love to see the church growing. I love to see this room getting filled up. Um, how many, let me see here. How many, we should get it. Okay, that section back there, you guys. So we need about 200 invites. Can I get 200 hands? Let's say I'm bringing 200 people next week. 200 hands. That's 40, 45, 50. We got some more in the back. Okay. Can we fill up this room next Wednesday? All right, you guys almost did it. I'm super proud, but let's do it next week. All right, so Vision 1728 is all about making disciples that make disciples. And then the room went quiet. It's all about making disciples of Jesus Christ that make disciples. All right. We got to get crazy excited about it because the more disciples we have out there, the more souls we are going to save. When I was um, getting ready this week, um, I was getting, you know, I had a passage because we're going through the growth book on Wednesday nights. And we're in 1 Corinthians. How many Paul fans? Any uh, Apostle Paul fans? Front row. You are with me, front row. Anything you guys want after service in the cafe? Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. My husband's all, what? Okay. <laughs> all right. So we are in, in 1 Corinthians in our growth books, okay, in your DGs. You are going through these lessons, and it has been powerful, right? And I got the amazing opportunity to go over one of the lessons. But then I looked online. You know, I was excited. And I'm not saying I changed the word. Don't worry. Don't worry, media team. What I'm saying is I was excited. I love our discipleship lessons. I was ready to go, and I looked online, and there is drama. Anybody see drama online? Like on CNN, on Fox News, on your friend's YouTube channel, on Instagram. Okay, you definitely saw some drama if you were on TikTok, okay? Okay, there is drama out in the world right now. We've got fires, we've got earthquake, we got the, the sun is growing red, okay? We have all kinds of wars and rumors of wars. We've got the book of Revelations coming alive. I saw somebody post the other day, thank you for sharing the apocalypse with me. What? It's wild out there. 
And, and I'm going to be honest, it made me think, like, we don't need to be in 1 Corinthians. We need to be in Revelations. Calm down, calm down. I was like, Lord, we got to get ready. You are coming quick. And then the Lord reminded me what we're about to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 27. We heard it in the offering. We heard it in the worship. We hear it every week here at the Wayworld Outreach. If Jesus is coming quick, then we better get quick about saving souls for Jesus. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's right around the corner, guys, does anybody have a family member that doesn't know Jesus? I do. If you need one, you can use one of mine. Okay. Does anybody have a neighbor who really needs Jesus? Really needs, okay, we're praying for your neighborhood watch. Okay. Uh, and so tonight we're going to get into our DG lesson from 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 27. Now the title is Becoming a Slave to the Freedom of Others. I know that does not sound like it makes sense. you got to really slow it down and think about it. Like, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I have to become a slave so that they can be free? That, no, Jesus already died for them. I'm good. But how many people know God's asking something of you tonight? Like he gave you everything. Can Jesus ask for something? All right, all right. How about the back of the room? Are you any louder? Can Jesus ask you for something tonight? Whoa, somebody back there is sold out. God bless you. Okay. All right, that's what I'm talking about. So um, in 1 Corinthians here, um, the reason I'm saying, can he ask you for something, is because when I read the passage, because when I open up my growth book, what I like to do is like I read, I pray, I read through it, and then I go back over it, and I start to like break it down. I start to chew on it a little bit, right? And so um, when I opened up this passage, this word kind of had stuck out to me. And I went back to study it again for tonight, and it, it was just ringing in my ears again. I'm just like, whoa, look at that, look at that. Like, why is that there? Um, in, in a matter of, I think, eight or nine scriptures, there is one word that is used 25 times in, in the NLT version in my growth book. I was counting. One, two, three, four. Does anybody know what that word is? No. Nobody else counted words in their growth book this week but me? Okay. That's okay. I did it for you guys. I. I. Isn't that the craziest word to hear over and over and over again? I. Paul kept using that word 25 times. And I thought, why, God, would he emphasize I so much? And God was like, because I already did what I said I would do. Now it's time for you to do. You better hear that again. Jesus already did what he said he was going to do. He came. He defeated hell. He defeated sin. He defeated the grave. <laughs> Jesus died for your sins. Jesus forgave you. Jesus set you free. How many people in the room, you're in your right mind because Jesus gave it to you? Woo! That's a big crowd. I'm right there with you. And now Jesus is saying, it's your turn to do. So we're going to get in here. And just the way I like to start DG or the way I like to start reading my growth book, I'm going to begin with prayer. Let's pray for some revelation. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now. We are stepping into your word. We are standing before your presence. And God, we are asking for 
your revelation. We are asking for understanding. We are asking for application to your word. We don't want to just be hearers. We don't want to just be an audience. God, we don't want to just sit in a seat. But God, this is a moment of preparation and impartation. The world is ending. You are coming back. We aren't ignorant to the fact. But the enemy doesn't get to win in our families anymore. The enemy doesn't have authority in our job sites, in our children's schools. The enemy isn't in charge of the elections or the laws. The enemy doesn't have the final say, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Your children, your disciples are getting up with a shout in this season to draw all men back to you, Jesus. You saved us. Now use us to save those who need you most. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys ready? Come on. Okay, so. In the first chapters of 1 Corinthians, let me give you a little breakdown because I feel like I'm in biblical studies class. So, um, in the first chapters of biblical, I'm sorry, yeah, I almost said it. In the first chapters of 1 Corinthians, what happens is Paul begins to give us this foundation or this setup. Okay? He's letting you know everything God has done and given to you so that you know that you are fully equipped for the work he wants you to do. He talks to you about the spiritual gifts that have been given. He talks to you about the relationship you get to have with Jesus. He talks to you about the wisdom and glory of God that you have access to, that you can never be without him because he is always with you. And then he starts to tell you what to do and what not to do. See, after salvation, after we hear the good news, comes discipleship. And Paul is discipling. Paul is saying, live like this, don't live like that. Paul is saying, act like this, don't act like that. Say this, don't say that. He's encouraging us. He's exhorting us. He's teaching us. Because he's getting ready to send us out. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we start off, and I'm going to break this passage of Scripture down into three parts. We're going to read 19 through 21, because I like to do a lot of stops in my reading, okay? And then we're going to break down to two more parts. At the end, we're going to get super, super practical. So I hope, if you don't take notes during the whole sermon, which I hope you do, take them at the end for sure. But Verse 19 through 21, let's hear. It says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Paul says right out the gate, even though. Even though is a, is a phrase that you use when you're saying, okay, I know, I know about the facts, I know the situation, I know, but even though... This is still true. Even though I used to be a sinner, even though you used to catch me in the clubs, even though I used to be addicted, even though I was a liar, gossiper, two-timer, cheater, even though I'm free. free because of me though. I am free because of what Jesus did. And, and unfortunately, I wanted to say this, that there's some people in the room tonight, like you came up to this altar. You emptied your pockets. You put your cigarettes on, on the altar. You repented. You did holy warriors. You got water baptized. But the enemy keeps accusing you. The enemy keeps telling you you're not good enough. Remember what you used to do? People can't listen to you. You can't lead. You can't serve. Your hands were dirty. You can't do things in church. Who in the world would you ever be able to disciple? Who would listen to you? That's a demonic voice. 
That's a voice of intimidation. That's a voice that is trying to deny you of the purpose God assigned to your life. And we are here to tell it to shut up in the name of Jesus. We're not listening to that voice anymore. Because Paul didn't deserve his freedom. And some of us in this room don't either. But because Jesus loved you, you got free. Accusation, your past, right? Temptation, none of those things have authority over you when you make yourself a slave to Jesus. So it says right here, even though, sorry, I get stuck on two words. Welcome to my DG. We'd be here for a minute. I'll be like looking up some grammar, like, well, what does that mean? What's the original language, even though? <laughs> all right, all right. Even though I am free, I'm forgiven, I've been redeemed, I'm empowered by the grace of Jesus, right? He says, I have become. Wait a minute. I was this, now I'm that. And you're asking me to become something more? Yes. Yes, you're saved. But can you be a leader? Yes, you're saved. But can you be a growth coach? Yes, you're saved. But can you be a tither? Yes, you're saved. But can you win souls for Jesus? Can we become more? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Verse 20. This is going to be a long night. Okay. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. I'd be like, wait a minute. So Paul was seeker friendly? Did, was Paul, like, compromising, like, pretending to be a Jew with the Jews and pretending to be a Gentile with the Gentiles? See, I ask questions like that. No, he wasn't doing those things. See, Paul isn't telling you when you hang out with your friends that smoke weed, okay, that you should start rolling some blunts for them. No. I had to ask my husband what it was called earlier. I said, what do you call it when they're smoking the marijuana? <laughs> you know, what do you call that stuff? Um, you know, there's, there's new language I don't have, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, when, when you're with your friends that, that are gossiping, right, or are dressing like hoochies, do you do that too? No. But your friends who don't know Jesus, okay, do you, do you cut them off? No, you evangelize to them. You be a witness in front of them. And so in this passage right here, Paul is saying, you know what? If what the Jews need to give me an audience is for me to ceremonially wash my hands and eat kosher, I'm doing it all day. Don't worry. Like what we don't want to do is sit down with a Jew for breakfast that we're trying to witness to and then order a half pound of bacon. Mm -mm. So what he's saying is don't come in and be offensive with your person, with your personal behavior to keep people from receiving the gospel. See, we want people to want to hear our good news. We want people to want to listen to us. Drew was sharing the other day, he said he's out on adopt a block. I'm Drew, I'm sharing your whole story right now for a second, my bad. But he said he's out on adopt a block. He's just walking up to this apartment complex, and this guy comes running out, and he's like, I need help. Like he just saw adopt a block show up. Nobody knocked on his door. Nobody asked him if he needed Jesus yet. And they are running out, people. There's people you know. There's people that are, are next to you in the cubicle at work. There's people sitting next to you at the coffee shop right now, at McDonald's right now, and they need Jesus. And you got it. So Paul's saying, act right so people can receive what you have to say. 
Thank you. I'm glad I got so many claps on that. Act right. Hmm. Write it down, everybody. Okay. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. Now, there's a lot about this Jewish law, right? It's Jewish customs. They got like over 600 laws. Do you know like on the, on the Sabbath for them, they can't even um, push the button for an elevator because that would be working a machine and they would be guilty on the Sabbath. Exactly. You see no cars on the road in Israel, okay, because they're observing the Sabbath. Wild. Okay. Now, is that going to save your soul? If you didn't take the elevator and you walked up the stairs? I'd be like, I worked a lot harder taking the stairs, Jesus. Like, a lot harder. So, Paul is saying, I'm not under that Jewish law. It can't save me. It can't redeem me. It can't make my, my sin that was red as scarlet, white as snow. Only the blood of Jesus redeems me. I'm not confused. I've given myself completely to him. And he's the only law I obey. But what's the law of Christ? See, it's mentioned only a few times in the Bible, and he says, I obey, Paul says, I obey the law of Christ. So I'm out here trying to evangelize. I'm not letting anything intimidate me or hold me back. I got my head in the game. I've made a choice, not my desires, not my will, not mine, but God's, and I'm willing to be a slave to win people to Jesus, to serve them, to accommodate them, and the only law I'm submitted to is the law of Christ. So it would be important to know what that law is, right? Right. I would want to know. So the law of Christ is this. We've heard it a few times. We just probably didn't associate it because we usually reference it as a command. You should love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. If you, the, Jesus said, if you would obey those things, you would fulfill all the law. And that is what we need to be focused on in this room. I need to love God with everything. I don't need to love my fornication more than I love my Jesus. I don't need to love those uh, pornographic movies more than I love Jesus. We should not love our sin more than the one who set us free from sin. We've got to love him and live for him. If we, he says, if you love me, obey my commands. It's that simple for Jesus. Obey me. And what did Paul say? I obey him, period. So point number one. <laughs> I'm going to look over here. Choose sacrificial love. Because love, Jesus, sacrificed for you. Choose it. Choose to walk in, to give sacrificial love. Because John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, each and every single one of us, because of love, he gave his only begotten son. Sacrificed him on a cross. Suffered a brutal death. So that you could be forgiven. So that you could get what you did not deserve even when you didn't want it. He loved you that much. Sacrificial love just like Paul said a minute ago, isn't about lowering the standard. It's not about watering down the gospel. See, we don't have to start playing secular music in our foyers, okay, in, in order to get people to come to church. We don't have to take Super Bowl Sunday off, even though I know some of you tried to ask. Like, we're showing up in the house of God, okay? You guys could have been a lot of places tonight on a Wednesday night, but you guys got up. You got off of work. You drove through somewhere, picked up some food, probably ate on the way, and you said, whatever it takes, I am going to be in the house tonight. <laughs> because I love God, I'm willing to sacrifice sometimes. There's a story I read, and oh my gosh, did it move me. There's a story about an Armenian 
Russian, he's Armenian and Russian, I guess, Olympic swimmer. And in 1976, as he was jogging along, doing his training, with 45-pound weight strapped to his body, he heard a crash. And he saw this trolley bus had gone off the road and into this sewage-infested lake, Lake Yevin. And he ran over, took the weights off. And this is Russia, so it's cold. And he began to dive into the water in the sewage-infested muck that you couldn't even see through. Now, you might think like, whoa, he's a hero. He's awesome, okay? And he said that he paused and, and he saw this moment and, and he, was, um, he was fearful, he said. He saw the water. But what scared him even more was the death that those people were about to endure if he didn't act. He knew they would drown. See, he was an Olympic swimmer. And so he knew very much about the dangers of water. And so not regarding his own safety, he jumps in. Now this trolley was about 80, I think they said 80 feet from shore. So he's got to swim out and then swim down. And he begins to pull bodies. He's just, he's just reaching in and he's trying to see and he can barely see. And he's reaching in and he's pulling out whatever shape he can find. He's pulling people out one after the next. And he's swimming them back to shore and he's leaving them there because there's nobody that's qualified to swim quite like him. In fact, because of his strength, okay, he was able, the trolley bus windows had to be broke open, and he kicked them open with his feet, and the glass had cut up his legs, but he kept swimming. He kept going, and he pulled out between 35 and 40 people from the wreck before his body gave out. I, yeah. Yeah. There were 92 people on that bus. Shortly after this event, he was hospitalized. And he spent 45 days in the hospital because he had gone septic due to the cuts in his legs and the sewage in the water. And he experienced severe pneumonia that damaged his respiratory system. He would never swim competitively again. His Olympic career was over. And when interviewed about this event and asked if he had regrets, some of us might have thought that he gave up his career, that he lost his health and strength. But Shavarsh said, I knew that I could only save so many lives. I was afraid to make a mistake in one of my dives, I accidentally grabbed a seat instead of a passenger. I could have saved a life instead. That seat still haunts me today. He was moved with compassion because of the natural disaster, destruction that was about to happen to these people. And he said, I can't let them go into that watery grave, into that torment, and experience that torture. If I have the ability to move and to act, if I have the strength in my body, I'm going to do something about it. Each and every single one of us has experienced the salvation of God in our lives if you've received him. If you have given him your life, he lives in you and he has empowered you. 
He strengthened you against sin and, and sorrow. He strengthened you against your past. He's equipped you with his word and his spirit and his gifts. But are you just sitting by as people plunge into the lake of sin? Are you just an observer on the shore? Or are you willing to step in? In Philippians 3, 7 through 8, Paul also says, I once thought these things were valuable. I once thought being somebody important and having money and, and feeling accomplished and, you know, having a big house. I once thought having um, a, a, a name for myself in church and among society was important. I, I once thought obeying Jewish laws and customs, I thought those were valuable things. I thought they were important things. I once thought. And that was before he knew Jesus. But now I consider them worthless. Imagine considering your Olympic career, your dream since you were a child, worthless compared to a soul. Even if it was just one. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. See, Paul changed the way he thought, and it ended up not just changing the way he lived, but the way people all over, right, the region he went to Macedonia and Italy and to Spain and to Corinth and Philippi. He traveled everywhere, giving them the gospel and teaching them to live different. Jesus is asking us, because I saved you, can you go? Can you save souls? Can you start to think different? Can you value different things? That word slave that was mentioned in the beginning, that word slave means to give myself wholly to one's needs and service. The greatest need of all mankind is salvation, and that's why Jesus came. In John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, than to, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, Jesus isn't asking you to throw yourself into the lake, to risk your health and life. But Jesus is saying, can it not be about your comfort? Can it not be about your own personal achievements and goals? But can you make the most valuable thing that you ever obtain in life souls that get reconciled back to him? When we deny ourselves and put others' needs ahead of our own, that's when we are the most Christ-like really quickly with the time we have left. Number two, it's going to take going to where the people are to reach them. So that Olympic swimmer couldn't stay on the shore and say, I'm going to throw you a dinghy and if you, if you get on it and float in, I'll help you. He couldn't throw a rope out there and say, if somebody grabs hold, I'll pull them out. See, people are caught in the prison cell of sin. They're held in the clutches of the enemy. They can't get free until you go to them and help them. You need to go where the people are. And guess what? That's going to be in your workplaces. That's going to be on the city streets. It's going to mean you getting up on a Saturday morning and hitting the streets with a doctor block. It's going to mean you coming out of your comfort zone and sharing your testimony, being vulnerable. 22 says, verse 22 says, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. I do everything I can. I share or I become. It means show yourself to be something to someone. 
see, that swimmer went physically. Sometimes you need to go mentally. Sometimes you need to go emotionally. And what am I meaning by that? You have to stop judging those people who are where you used to be. You have to stop looking down on them. Like, why is she dressed like that? Because she doesn't know any better. She hasn't found her value in Jesus yet. Why doesn't he ever get his stuff together? Why does he get a job and act right? Because he doesn't know how yet. He's not free to do those things. Paul didn't judge. Jesus didn't judge. We don't need to judge. Meet people where they're at. We need to be vulnerable and transparent. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he didn't sin. See, you think if people know the dirt you came from, they're going to look down on you. They're going to judge you, that you're not going to be able to be a DG leader. All the best DG leaders have a pastor around here. I know. And yet, Jesus uses us. So I'm going to ask you to show people your scars. Show people where you've hurt, where you've fallen, and where Jesus got you back up again. And in John 20, 27, we see this just profound moment. When Thomas had doubted that Jesus had actually resurrected, and he told the disciples, unless I put my hand in his side, unless I see the scars, I can't believe. Do you know Jesus didn't condemn him for that? Jesus didn't say, I told you all this. I taught you. You walked with me. Why don't you believe me? Instead, Jesus showed up, and Jesus said, Put your hand in my side. See the scars. And he believed. When we are open and transparent and willing to share our testimony with others, it makes the gospel real for them. It doesn't need to sound like a fairy tale. It needs to sound like, I was a hot mess. Jesus saved me. He can do that for you. I'm looking at Chris. He hasn't kicked me off stage. Three, endurance training requires submission to the trainer and denial of our flesh. We need to stop responding to how we feel and what we think, and we need to start building endurance if we are going to do this thing. 24 through 27, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now, I don't have a personal trainer, surprise, but I know some personal trainers. And this is the thing, guys. In the natural, um, it's not about me saying, oh, train me, but I'm not going to be self-disciplined. It's about I'm getting training and I'm going to be self-disciplined. Because if I eat whatever I want and then I go to the gym, and guess what? My results are compromised. And, and if I eat really healthy but I go to the gym only when I feel like it, I probably won't see any results. So it's about us getting self-disciplined if we are going to have endurance. It's about us training our bodies not to say, I'm staying home, not to say, I don't want to read my word, not to say, I don't want to be in a DG, not me saying, I don't want to open my mouth and look like a fool, but me being willing in every situation to do everything that God is asking of me despite how I feel. I 
I'm going to skip ahead because I think I'm out of time and I want to give you these points because self-discipline is really important. So C, how to discipline yourself to run and win with purpose. See, he didn't just say run. He said run to win and he said run with purpose. Every single step you take needs to be intentional. Everything you do right now matters. It matters for eternity. It matters in people's lives. So how do we do that? How do we win, which means uh, we're saving souls for Jesus. We obtain new souls for Jesus. We lay hold of them because that's the purpose or the reason you were saved and created by the Lord. Okay? How do we do this? Philippians 3, 12 through 14. We're going to break it down really quick. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. No, dear brothers and Oh, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. All right, here's your five points on how to become self-disciplined. Ready? Are you ready? Number one, choose a goal. Paul in this passage says, reach for perfection. Perfection means add what I am lacking so I will be fully equipped for the work that God has for me to do. Save souls, disciple others, lead, serve, give. In order for me to fulfill that, I need what I don't have right now. Reach for perfection in Christ. Number two, find your motivation. Well, that's easy. What Jesus did for you should be motivation enough. Number three, identify the obstacles in your life. Like, what's keeping you? So he says it right here. He says, I focus, okay? You need to be alert. You need to be scanning ahead. Where are you at? What's your next step? How am I going to get there? I'm never going to get there if I don't take a next step. Number four, replace old habits. Again, he says, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead in verse 13. Forget those things that hurt you. Forget those things that tempted you. Forget those things that used and abused you. Forget those things that intimidated you. And when he's saying forget it, it doesn't mean your mind goes blank. He's saying, why are you caring about it so much when I love you, when I've saved you? And five, monitor your progress. When you're learning to be self-disciplined so you can fulfill the work of God in your life, you need accountability in your life. You need to join Holy Warriors and get a growth coach. You need to come out into the foyer on Sunday and talk to a DG leader and start attending a group regularly. And for those of you who are in a DG, but you show up once a month, yeah, I heard about it. <laughs> Start showing up every week. And when I say show up, bring your growth book, okay? Be alert. If you need to get a coffee on the way in, get a coffee. I understand. You need to be ready to receive in those moments. Verse 27 warns us not to be disqualified. Let's not fall short. Let's be in position. Let's be ready to do everything that God has for us to do. Now, are you guys willing to live your life in a way that glorifies God? Are you willing to discipline your flesh so that you can save others? Are you willing to do the work to save someone besides yourself? See, that Olympic swimmer had done the work physically. He had trained and conditioned his natural body. But I think he also prepared his heart. He sacrificed a lot that day. But you guys know he did it again. In 1985, there was a structure fire. He was a father of four at the time. And not regarding his own life. 
but fearing what would happen to the people in that place if he didn't act. He ran into the building to pull people out. Jude says that they're to rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. So I'm asking you in this room tonight. Stand with me. If you heard these stories, and inside you felt like, I need saving. I need someone to come rescue me. Jesus is here. Jesus is ready to receive you. Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. And there is nothing that you have ever done. There is nothing that has been done to you that could resist his love for you right now. You don't have to stay in the prison of sin. You don't have to stay bound to your past. If the voice of the accuser has been mocking you and telling you, you can't serve. You're not good enough to lead. People still see your old sin. It's time to tell them to shut up and take the next step. See, I was once asked about my why. Why do you do what you do? And I love to tell people. Because I know what it's like to know what God's word says. To know that there's a God who exists. And to still live bound and in the darkness. To not be free. And I showed up at a Way World Outreach service over 21 years ago. And I heard a message that would change my life. I heard God tell me, stay here. He's going to help you. And I thought I was losing my mind. I hated myself. I hated my life. I was drinking, I was cutting, I was fornicating. And I stayed. I didn't let my condition keep me from his presence. And when I heard that altar call, I didn't stay in my seat. I was tired. I was tired of wrestling with the sin. I was tired of the tormenting thoughts. I, I was tired of the depression. I was tired of the drinking. I was tired of feeling alone. And I entered the best relationship I've ever had. The altar workers are going to come up right now. I want to make two calls. I want to talk to those who have been equipped. You did, holy warriors. You've been saved. You know him. He set you free. But you're standing on the shore. And you haven't jumped in. Whether it's intimidation. Whether you didn't have the motivation before. I hope that tonight. That tonight put a fire inside of you. That says, when I see somebody going down, when I see a lost soul, when I see that somebody is perishing, I am going to do something about it. So if that's you tonight, if you're in this place, and you got all free and cleaned up, you've got all strong and in your right mind, 
and you're ready to take the next step and you want to come into agreement with somebody or maybe you have a little bit of, of that intimidation trying to tell you you can't and you want to silence that voice, then I want to invite you to come up to this altar tonight. I want to invite you to get out of your seat. I want you to say, God, if you need me, I'll go. God, if you send me a soul, I'm going to respond. I'm not going to stay silent. I'm not going to stay still. We don't want to stay in our seats, guys. We want to move. And if you don't know Jesus tonight, And like I said earlier, it was pulling on you. And it was telling you, right? I need salvation. I'm, I'm in that lake right now drowning. I'm in that building that's on fire right now. I'm in the midst of depression and, and fear and bondage and I need to get free. Then we want you to come up here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, guys. I'm going to invite Pastor Christian up here right now to pray with you guys. He's our campus pastor. And we want you guys to be, to be ready for whatever God has for you in this season. Thank you. Come on, can we give God praise for that word tonight? And can we give God some praise for all those that are making a decision to follow Jesus tonight? This will never get old. We're going to say a quick word of prayer. Before I do, I just want to let everybody up here know that your next step is a class called Holy Warriors. Say it with me. Say Holy Warriors. Class starts this Sunday morning at 9 a.m. This class will help you to walk, learn how to walk with God, learn how to pray, learn how to fight battles, learn how to win some battles, learn how to be free in Jesus' name. That'll be this Sunday at 9 a.m. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, and they're going to get you signed up. But let's bow our heads. Those that are out there right now, just stretch your hands towards everybody up here as we just lift them up in prayer. I want everyone to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross and you rose from the dead to save me. I was the person drowning in the bus and you rescued me. You sacrificed your life so that I can live. Thank you. Forgive me of my sin. I repent. I turn away from my old life and I give my heart to you. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me. Fill me with your spirit. I put my faith in you. I believe in you. And I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, one more shout of praise to God.